Um, today we're going to talk about um, one of the most basic things that comes up in this business. How do you get work? I'd like to introduce the panel now. Um, starting to my right is a wonderful musician, violinist. Her name is Karen Briggs. <laughs> and Karen will be performing tomorrow evening. Yeah. Tomorrow evening, Saturday at 7 p.m. in the Terrace Theater as part of the festival. Seated next to her is another fine musician, Joyce DiCamillo. She's a pianist. And Joyce and her trio performed last night, and they were wonderful. Um, to my left is Alexa Birdsong. Alexa is a producer and... Gosh, she does so many things as, as many of us in this business do, but... Um, Right now, Alexa is just coming off of the New Orleans Heritage Music Festival, which she produces every year. Um, what do you have coming up? You've got the Louis Armstrong 100th birthday celebration that's coming up July 14th in uh, Aaron Davis Hall in Harlem, which is a very big deal. You're going to be doing the empowerment um, do seminars? The Essence Empowerment Seminars mm -hmm. in New Orleans for the big music festival. Yeah. And... Um, Gosh, you got an awful lot of things going on, but there's special events and concert promotions that, that Alexa normally does. And seated next to her on uh, my far left is John Poses. John is a promoter who joins us today from uh, his base in Columbia, Missouri. Um, again, John has a, a history of doing everything from booking to producing to writing. He's also a journalist. So um, we all wear more than one hat. I, I think you kind of get that theme going here. Anyhow, um, I'd like to start with, um, with Karen. And we're just going to talk a little bit about how each one of us got into the business and how we first came to get work. <laughs> so let me start with Karen. OK, I'm going to give you my perspective. Um, I started playing the violin in junior high school when I was about 12 years old. I took violin because my mother wouldn't allow me to take home ec. It's true. <laughs> the other two choices were orchestra and band. I thought it, orchestra looked cool. The teacher I had that was uh, promoting the orchestra to get more students made it look very hip. They played uh, songs by the Spinners and Barry White and the hip folk of our day. And I thought, well, I'll go with that. And if I don't make it, I'll, I'll play violin because I had to walk a mile to school. It was lightweight. And uh, if it was band, they didn't have enough room. I'd play flute. And that was lightweight. And uh, I ended up being in an orchestra, and I think maybe three years later, I got my first paying job playing at a wedding. I charged $25 to play at a huge wedding at a big church in Virginia. This guy came to a concert recently and reminded me of that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I ended up really enjoying it, but I think by the time I was in the 11th grade in high school, I knew this is really what I want to do. There's, I can't couldn't picture myself doing anything else, uh, even though I majored in something else. Uh, the violin was pretty much it. I cover it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Joyce, what about you? Well, I started playing piano at the age of four, and I had a strictly classical upbringing, um, but I could always play by ear, which is how I first started taking lessons. My parents decided I should take lessons after I had picked out a few melodies at four years old, so I, I actually had parallel um, parallel things going on where I was always the accompanist for everything, uh, all the shows, all the choirs, all the orchestra work. And um, by the time I got to middle school, I joined the stage band that we had in middle school. And um, before that, all the years that I was growing up, I had this, is, uh, this special affinity for jazz. Uh, we didn't know it at the time. We were listening to a, a, just a marvelous array of jazz. It was on TV. You could turn on the television and... Uh, you know, hear Ella Fitzgerald and Ed Sullivan or Jerry Mulligan or Dizzy Gillespie, or you name it. We heard it and we grew up with it. And it would make me tingle every time I heard anything in 4-4. And uh, I would run over to the piano and try and pick it out. And I, I just don't know why, but it just it spoke to me in some way. So when we got to middle school and there was this thing called stage band, uh, I joined it. And um, 
we had a very strong music program in our school system. I can't say enough about that, but that was really the uh, determining factor in whether or not many of us went on to be career musicians. So when we got to high school, we were already listening to a lot of jazz. And even though we grew up in the era of rock and roll, uh, we were listening to the Stones and the Beatles and Earth, Wind and & Fire and you name it, the music that we got together to play was not that music, it was jazz, because we started to get asked to play jobs. And w if you played a job and you were 14, 15, 16 years old, you were playing it for your parents' generation. And your parents didn't want to hear the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. They wanted to hear the Sinatra, Tony Bennett, they wanted to hear all the standards, the wonderful music from the 40s on up. So that was the repertoire that we learned. And uh, I think it was a really a, a glorious period to, to grow up in because now the, the young people growing up don't have that available to them. They have to seek it out. So we would play jobs for $25 and as 15, 16 year olds. And we learned how to play a gig and we learned it very early on. And uh, the, the jobs got longer and longer in length. You know, they started out with maybe a, a tune here, a tune there. And as they got longer, we became more well-versed in how to play a job and how to go out and seek a job after that you know, initial period of um, forming a band. So that was my beginning. Uh, and then I went on to college and studied classical music at Syracuse University School of Music, but I always played in bands. So even while I was in Syracuse, I had a, another parallel life with the townies. Uh, working in town with the, the jazz musicians in the area. And in upstate New York, it was a very fertile time for jazz. And um, we started playing a lot of gigs, and that took me on from there. Before we go any further, I'd like to find out how many, how the audience breaks down. Are we mostly instrumentalists, performers? Are there, um, can you raise your hand and just give me an idea of how many folks are? Um, performers or would like to be? Okay. Are there um, any, any of you who want to focus on the business aspect of the music of jazz? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so we're, we're going to probably be split down the middle here. We're going to offer both sides. You've got the artist perspective here. And on this side, we have the professional business minds. Uh, Alexis, how did you come to this being a producer? How did, how did that happen for you? Well, I uh, love music all my life. <clears throat> I was a child singer around New York City, going through my paces and ran into stiff competition as a teenager. Her name was Stephanie Mills. Aww. So I quickly got out of the business and uh, went to college and Graduated from college and got a job at a not-for-profit producing, doing certain things, and we produced a special event. Um, to make a long story short, there was a crisis, and they needed Colleen Dewhurst to be somewhere. There were no limos. I picked her up in a hansom cab, which is a horse and buggy, kids, <laughs> in midtown Manhattan and got her to the press conference. And that was when I knew that I could make things happen and I could handle stress. Um, <laughs> after that, I uh, worked in a nonprofit arena on, in film documentaries and so found my way to George Ween. I went, th I interviewed against 25 people. George Ween is a jazz impresario. I interviewed against 25 people. The process was three months long. I got the job. In the middle, in the meantime, I had made a documentary. <laughs> but it took so long, I, I got the job eventually and uh, it was brutal. Um, but I considered it getting a master's degree in jazz music and event marketing. And I worked there for five years and paid all my dues there. Yes, you did. <laughs> okay, and uh, what about you, John? Well, actually, uh, as a child, I, um, I studied classical piano and uh, was really, did not have the discipline. Um, one of my favorite stories is my next door neighbor, when I was growing up in New York, was a very, very accomplished, the whole family of very accomplished musicians, uh, pianists and violinists, cellists. And uh, there was one December, December night that I, of course, had not practiced and was dreading going to my lesson, just filled with fear. And uh, got in, in there and, of course, you know, the first order of business was to show what you had practiced and um, the lights started to flicker. 
and then they went out, and that was known as the New York City blackout, but that was like a really good thing. <laughs> So my piano career was somewhat short-lived, and then it turned into a would-be uh, rock guitar career, which was also short-lived when I realized I just did not have, um, as Alexa said, you know, sort of the, the competition, and, and I just didn't particularly feel comfortable playing in bands. It was just one of those things. Um, and uh, but I have always loved music, always followed music, and I got into jazz specifically when I was in Europe in 1976, and uh, sort of stumbled into the Montreux Jazz Festival, and was asked. I couldn't afford to go to any of the concerts, but uh, I, in exchange for cleaning up the grounds every evening, Claude Nobs, who was the producer of that festival, said, "Here's your pass to the next night." So I went for. I don't know, 12 or 14 nights in a row to, to the Montreux Jazz Festival, and that's really when I got personally hooked on jazz as a fan. Uh, never in my wildest dreams did I really think that I would become an event producer and uh, involved with musicians directly in booking and, and uh, representing them and touring them around the country and elsewhere. And uh, I got into journalism first, covering music, and it was through journalism, really, that uh, friends of mine in Columbia, Missouri, which uh, we can come back to later, which sort of shows you can do this from any place if you really sort of put your mind to it. Um, friends of mine uh, took over a country and western bar and turned it into a jazz venue. <laughs> <laughs> um, at any rate, they're, they're very good friends and it's a wonderful venue that uh, many, many players have, have stopped in and, and, and done hits there. Um, and they said to me, I was, I was right, I'd gotten, I came to Columbia, Missouri doing a master's in journalism and I was covering music and jazz and my friend said to me, if, if any of the players you're interviewing are coming through the Midwest, uh, we'd love for them to play at the restaurant, which is about a hundred seats and very, very intimate. And, uh, much to my amazement, you know, I was able to you know, sort of trial by fire, able to put together one show and then another show. And uh, it, was, it was a very interesting experience for me. N uh, I never sort of hung out my shingle and approached players and said, I want to represent you or I want to tour you. Uh, jazz at its, you know, highest level is what I refer to as a cottage industry in many ways. And so by word of mouth, for the last 15 or 18 years, I've received more calls than I know what to do with and uh, tour people around the country and uh, I still combine writing liner notes occasionally and um, have also gotten into producing a local, um, not a local, it's based in Columbia, a subscription series, a 10 concert subscription and education project known as the We Always Swing Jazz Series. And so I kind of divide my time, although the jazz series uh, now takes up most of my time where I put together a season and uh, much in the way that the Kennedy Center puts together a subscription season or Lincoln Center puts together or, or anybody around the country universities. So I kind of wear both hats in the sense that uh, I represent artists and try to get them gigs. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, I talk to the Linda Brambles of the world and try and, and other people like that and try and uh, contract artists to come to Columbia, Missouri, which as we say is conveniently located 2,000 miles from the west coast and 1,000 miles from the east coast. <laughs> so uh, it's, for those of you who don't know, it's dead center of the state of Missouri. If you don't know where Missouri is, well, I, di I did bring the atlas with me. But uh, we, can, uh, <laughs> we can hold off on that. I, I'd like to um, take advantage of what you just said and, and Ask, ask you, what kind of advice would you offer to a young artist starting out, an emerging artist? Um, how much does geography have to do with it? Well, it's, it has, I mean, and I don't know, I know we have all levels here, but um, from a touring standpoint, I, I make fun of the road atlas, but when I first started booking tours and representing jazz artists, the road atlas was, the geography was unbelievably important 
But the interesting thing is you can find venues and you can find presenters and people who will give you gigs who want to give you gigs in a variety of places that you would never think. And so geography, linking this country through the road map is, is really, really important. I mean, it's, I, I don't, it's, it's, it's not something I never would have thought of, but uh, when you take out the road atlas, you can look up all the colleges, all the universities, all uh, the museums, all, a lot of things. And uh, one of my favorite gigs was getting a, a group of musicians uh, um, a job at, at Leavenworth in Can <laughs> Leavenworth Prison. Of course, I'm not so sure the, the musicians were that happy, but it really did fit in the routing. <laughs> but <laughs> but, uh, but you can literally hop, skip, and jump uh, across this country. Now, obviously, air travel enters into it and uh, time zones, and you, get, you refine your ability to, to find people work uh, as you get more and more into it. And I look at it as a big jigsaw puzzle and a big challenge to try and make this work without, and, and the musicians can speak to this, and it is really important that you do not drive musicians into the ground by creating all kinds of crazy routing that are literally or virtually impossible to make. So geography definitely has, has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Karen and Joyce, when you started out, did you, were you driven to, to gigs by you know, your friends and the family? How, how did that work? How did you go about contacting these places where you started to work? How did that all happen for you? Well, for me, uh, the best promotion that I'd ever had, and is promotion, was uh, word of mouth. Every gig I've ever gotten in my entire life to this day was because someone saw me play with someone or in a group or they saw me performing somewhere and uh, as a result they approached me and asked me about doing another date and it kind of latched on from there and so when I've relocated for example I, I grew up in Virginia by the time I started playing the violin and I went back to New York and I played at the Apollo Theater that was an easy in played the amateur night contest and I won a lot of them actually playing gospel at that time I uh, survived by doing a lot of diverse styles of music, but I have always considered myself an improvising violinist in whatever style or context I performed in. So then I left New York after about two years or so, flew all the way to California, Los Angeles, and stayed there. It's been a total of 12 years now, but uh, the first place I played was, uh, I guess some of you may be familiar with the actress Marla Gibbs. She had a club there, and I <laughs> went there and played in a talent show contest, and. One thing led to another. I, I just had to play somewhere and have the confidence to sit in with people, um, approach them in such a way that, I don't know, whatever the charm I needed to do to get them to pay attention and at least approach me so I can say I play violin, and usually that would lead to a conversation that would ensue me going on stage and sitting in with them, try to do a good job with what I had to work with by just simply plugging in and just playing as well as I could under, under whatever the sound circumstances were with violin. That can be a little tricky. but. Um, it always, uh, in my case, I guess because of the uniquity of what I do, it seemed to catch on. You know, people hadn't seen violin. I, I would imagine for uh, vocals, piano, and other more common instruments, it may be a bit of a more challenge, but I don't, I don't view it that way because everyone has their own signature that they can apply to what they do. I had a signature that I came with uh, because of my varied background, the different styles. It just created a signature that made me stand out. Uh, in another way that caught people's eye and ear and memory. So they did uh, call me for other jobs from that point on. All kinds of jobs, you wouldn't believe the type of work. I, I've stood, I've done Fiddler on the Roof. I've had people hire me, I put on a tuxedo, pay for the rental, top hat and stand on the roof and play and they'd send a waiter up and bring, that was the weirdest gig I've ever had. But I've played in symphonies, I've played in string quartets, I've played in jazz fusion groups, I've played in new age groups, but I've done a huge variety. Charanga, uh, Afro-Cuban music, I've played an awful lot of salsa and Latin music, reggae, whatever I thought I could fit into, R&B, <laughs> rock, uh, whatever I thought I could fit into, I, I did. And whoever saw it would call me for another gig. So that's pretty much how I did it. And that was before the agent came into the picture and the manager, because uh, 
think after I did the uh, big New Age gig with Yanni, with the television broadcast and all that, it got to a point where I couldn't deal with it anymore. It was too big for me, so I needed help. But uh, up to that point, I had survived pretty well uh, managing myself just in that way. It was more word of mouth. So the first thing is, Get yourself out there and yes. perform. Let them see in you. as many venues as you can. Yes. Um, also, going hand in hand with that is, you know, what we call a press kit, mm. picture, a biography. Um, what else do you need? Joyce has a beautiful press kit that she sends out in booking her trio, and um, she can speak to this. I, I think. Uh, well, it's interesting. Because when you mentioned that this was the business side and this was the artistic <laughs> yeah. side, yeah, really. I, I almost take issue with that. Because uh, when I was a freelance musician in my 20s, I, d I learned very quickly that the phone does not ring. And uh, we need to become business women, as businessmen, business women, as well as artists. And in the past, it was not true. Uh, now it is sadly the truth, and it is. It's an incredible phenomenon because this is the very last thing you want to do as an artist. You want to focus on your art, and you cannot do that anymore. It almost, be, it almost takes over your time, and I know that we have been uh, doing this for over 20 years as a trio. So, um, you know, I have two different segments of career. I have pre-CD and post-CD, and the pre-CD career was uh, strictly a local, and we're from Connecticut, and, and we were local, then we became tri-state. And becoming tri-state took a while, mm -hmm. frankly. And um, doing the local gigs get established a longevity of the, the trio. And then, as uh, she mentioned, it's always word of mouth. A word of mouth gets you the next gig, and the next gig, and the next gig. And if you are... Um, if you persevere and if you have uh, all of the different components, you're on time, you play well, which is the most important thing, you have to take care of the art, uh, but if you play well, if you look good, if you can present yourself as um, musicians who will always get the job done, you get the call, and sometimes you get the last minute call, and sometimes the last minute call is more important than the gig you have had booked for six months. Um, I remember we had um, an opportunity it was a wonderful opportunity to open for Nancy Wilson in New Haven at the Palace Theater. And this was really our first major um, undertaking as a trio. We had worked years and years in clubs and concerts and, and local venues. But that brought us essentially to the next level. So what do we do now? Press kit. <laughs> Why not? Because now we've done something worth talking about. And before that, you know, we had just been another jazz group that had managed to stick around for five, six, seven years. So now we put together a press kit. Now what goes into a press kit? You know, bios of people. And the bios, thankfully, have gotten longer and longer as the years have gone by. But once someone knows that you've opened for Nancy Wilson, maybe they think about you to open for Dizzy Gillespie or to open for the Basie Band when they come to town. And that's what happened to us. And, and we became a local trio who started to either back up musicians who came to town or to open for some of the bigger names. And as you open for some of the bigger names, you start to raise the bar for yourself a little bit. And then you no longer want to take uh, you know, the job in the local saloon that pays you know, $75 try because 50. now you've done, <laughs> try 50, right? Because now you've done something else and you feel like maybe it's time for you to jump to the next level if there is a next level. And, and someone told me something very interesting and, and, and this is very true. He said, there is something and some place for everyone in this business, and there's no reason why you shouldn't take your spot. And it was a very powerful thing. It's, it's obvious, but it's, it's not something that you really take to heart. And, you know, I believe that we had paid our dues. We had played, we had played as sidemen for many, many years. Uh, Rick Patron and Joe Corsello that I play with had played with every big name there was to play with. I mean, they were part of uh, Marion McPartland's trio, and I inherited them. But we had gone to high school together, and, co and we had known each other since we were children, really. And um, we thought that our, maybe our time had come. So then um, we raised our families. We were a local group. We did, we did everything there was to do. We played malls and railroad stations at 6 in the morning, and you name it. We played it. We were always available to play. And um, then we had the good fortune to put out a CD at a time when we never thought this would happen to us. Putting out a CD really changed the whole ballgame because putting together a press kit 
meant one thing. It meant you would get local work, maybe you would get tri-state work. But once we had a CD, now we had national airplay. We were lucky enough to get the CD to someone who could mail it out to all the radio stations and who would get us airplay. And getting us airplay brought us to the next level. And it's always, you know, you have to aspire to the next level. And if you don't aspire, it won't happen. It's always a, a dream that you have. And you make, just make the dream come true. You get on the phone, you put the press kit together, and gradually the pages start coming. It's been, it's been a, a wonderful ride, I have to say. But we have done it ourselves for over 20 years. And I'd like to come back tomorrow to tell you the truth because, you know, I think that there are walls up for those of us who have done our own work. And there are so many venues beyond which you cannot travel if you don't have management and rep representation. Mm -hmm. However, I feel that on our own, we've managed to do some wonderful festivals, Guinness Jazz Festival in Ireland, Syracuse here. Uh, we travel all over the country doing master classes and seminars, but it's hard, hard, hard work. And it's a lot of uh, legwork and time on the phone and putting these press kits together, sending them out, spending a lot of money yes. in the meantime doing that and hoping to, to get the return. But, you know, it's, it's interesting because we don't seek fame. As jazz musicians, all we seek is to continue to play. And as the jobs dry up in your local area, it's not necessarily that you need to, you need to become a bigger and bigger name you need to go out there and find more and more work that exists. So as John mentioned, you try and create your own possibilities and try and find library series, concert series. Once you've, once you've drained all the ones in your area, you try and find the ones in the other states that are similar to the ones you've already played. So you keep on calling and calling and hope that the, the contacts will recommend you because I don't know about many of you, but I have a, I have a distaste for recommending myself as a musician. <laughs> You know, I will always say, come, please come to hear us, and hopefully you will like what you hear, and you will want to book us. But for me to get on the phone and say, we're wonderful, we swing, we're dynamic, no. we're, you can't do it. No, it's that's, just, that's a very hard it's thing It's very to hard. Do. So. I'd, like to, I'd like to go back a little bit and um, talk about what is a press kit, and how do you put one together, and then once you have one, what do you do with it, and how do you talk to people on the phone, and how do you know who to call? Who wants to? I am, um, there's this artist who hounded me for like five years, maybe oh. more, I hate to even think about, for gigs. I mean, she was relentless. And I had heard her perform ver at the beginning of those five years and I wasn't clearly, I wasn't impressed. Over those five years, she hounded me, she'd always send me flyers, whatever, whatever. In the sixth year, uh, she got a press, sent a press kit to me with a CD in it. And it was the most gorgeous press kit I had ever seen in my life. <laughs> It was beautiful. Her face was on the front. Her face was on the back. You <laughs> opened it up. The pages were lined like it, so it had bio. And you can just pull the bio out. They were staggered. And so around, I mean, public events and honors, awards. And it was just gorgeous. And her business card was there and it had her picture on it. It was just a beautiful, beautiful press kit. And I, I, I got on the phone and I was talking to other musicians about it. Um, consequently, she got a very cute gig for me this year <laughs> in New York City. Um, this took her six years for one gig, but she got it because she never gave up and she sent out a press kit that I could look at and I didn't have to strum through the pages just because the pages were staggered mm -hmm. and I could see this is the bio. So when they called and said, where's the bio? Boom, bio. I didn't have to read through it. You know, so a press kit is a pretty complicated thing. It's not as straightforward as one might think. I mean, it needs certain things, but it also needs to work for yeah. busy people who get hundreds of them every week or something. Well, that's why I think when you, can, when you prepare your press kit, you need to be cognizant of the fact that the folks who are reading it don't really have as much time to read it as you maybe had putting it into it. Um, and as a publicist, I can speak to that. Um, I think you want to make it simple. You don't want to make it really wordy. And, you know, and then after high school, <laughs> You know, and then, you know, I worked at three jobs, and then I worked at the mall. You, you can't do that. You've got to really try to solidify what's important. And I'm a firm believer in the one page. Yeah. The one page bio, <laughs> the one page, what right. we call a quote sheet. Right. A quote sheet, um, those of you who um, are lucky enough to 
accrue quotes. Um, they're taken from, from what other folks say about you over the years. Um, and those are very helpful for promoters in terms of presenting you. Um, you need to have a really good photograph. It doesn't have to be color. It does need to be black and white. It needs to be crisp and clear. And that means having a contrasting background. If you, know, if you have dark hair and you're very fair, but you're uh, against a very dark background, um, it, it's not going to come out as nice in a black and white newspaper as if you were against a, a light background. You need contrast. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. If you play an instrument, it's helpful, unless you're world-renowned, to hold up your instrument. Because people don't know by looking at you what you play. Uh, if, you, if you're a pianist, then um, Dr. Taylor's picture, I've got him leaning on the keyboard. And everybody knows who he is. But it's, it's very helpful um, in terms of promoting your, your appearances. Yes? Um, I, w I was going to actually, uh, I think, differ from both of you in terms of, of Prescott's. Now, I, I probably don't get as many as, as you do. I, I get a fair amount. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's interesting, and I think it's partly, I guess, my journalism background. The one thing that's very frustrating, well, take the flip side of that, um, and then, of and I realize we're talking about a select few, but uh, one of the things that's always amazing to me is that if you take somebody, um, let's say, of, of Dr. Taylor's stature or some of his peers, uh, people who have been on literally hundreds of records, and they send me a one sheet that sums up their incredible career in two paragraphs, it, which happens frequently, it's like, I know there's more to your life. <laughs> the other thing that happens is, um, you know, well celebrated artists, whenever they have a new record out, maybe they tour or whatever, and the record company sends you the bios, and it's all about the record. And it's like, I don't want to right. know, I know about this. I need some information to put in my program book. <laughs> right. But I think, again, when we're, when we're talking about emerging artists, right. those really aren't key issues. Um, you, you need to, to, you're going to be doing all this work on your own or with the help of family and friends if you're lucky. Um, if you have a friend who's a good photographer, not, it doesn't have to be a professional photographer, but someone who you know, takes good pictures. Yes. You know, have them sit with you and, and learn to get comfortable before the camera. Um, as far as writing your bio goes, you, if you're a good writer, you may want to try your hand yourself. But um, again, it's, it's just a, a matter of keeping it simple. It doesn't have to be any great prose. You just have to get the information out. Uh, I was just going to say, the, the, for the artists starting out, um, what I, and, and I deal with a number of quote unquote local musicians in Columbia, Missouri, who are, it's a university town. It's 120 miles from uh, both St. Louis and Kansas City. So in between is you know quite rural, and to to say that it's hard to find jazz work in that area is is an understatement. There's a limited until you get to St. Louis and Kansas City, or until Columbia. But I do know a couple of people in Columbia who have managed, although they're still working quote unquote casuals and they're still doing weddings, et cetera. But by and large, they're either teaching privately or have local jazz gigs, and they really are trying to carve out a legitimate career. If you get written about at all, or if you think that you can call your local newspaper and get them to come to one of your performances, even if you're not, let's say, the main attraction in the performance or you're part of a large ensemble, uh, if you're in high school or whatever, what I try to tell people who are trying to build a press kit is to, is to take that initial step to try and get something that is in print, that is about you, and to just sort of initially take, if you will, baby steps, and then gradually, as if you pursue the career, you will be able to replace, you know, you will look, you'll be able to see where you were at this point you know, down the line, and you can drop certain things from that press kit and keep updating it, and you'll realize that at one point what was major coverage or what you perceived as major coverage really is minor coverage, and you'll be able to supplant that with more up-to-date material. It is true about the record companies that they send 
more about, they don't really give you a, a bio of the artist. It's very germane to that particular you know, record, and that is frustrating. But everybody has a story to tell. Everybody is a legitimate uh, and has a le legitimate and deserves a legitimate shot at, at, at getting to be a known quantity. But you have to flesh that out. You have to be willing to say or have somebody say it about you, uh, and you do need a photo. There is no getting around it, and the bar has been raised in the CD world. I mean, um, let's face it, there's all kinds of craziness going on with the major labels and, and conglomerates and people eating up either, each other as, as far as record companies, but more and more, and I think the history of jazz will bear this out, there have been many, many more great releases issued on, and particularly in the last, say, 25, 30 years, on these so-called small independent labels. And more and more we're getting into the whole idea of burning CDs and self-production. The, the, the days of having a tape of yourself, uh, a cassette, and sending that cassette out are over. Um, that's, that's just the way it is. So you really need to sort of set these steps for yourself, photograph, uh, I don't. I don't. I am not particularly impressed by "quote unquote" slick press kits. Um, that's not to say that they don't have an impact, because obviously somebody has taken a lot of trouble to put them together. But what I am concerned about is: are all the pieces there? Is there a photo there? Is there, you know, some form of recorded material there? Is there? Do I know? I never heard of this person. They're introducing themselves to me. How are they doing it? I mean, what differentiates you from the next person? And it's not that easy. I'm not, I would never say that it is easy. It's a very difficult task. There's a lot of great musicians out there and a lot of great unknown musicians and lesser known musicians out there. And as many venues as there are around the country, there are far, far more great musicians. And it's a very competitive kind of deal. And and uh, in that way, of course, it's, it's part of America. <laughs> it's part of capitalism. It's part of any, like any other industry. So you have to do something, um, just sort of take care of business, you know, and you have to maintain a, a bio, maintain a press kit, maintain, just keep building it, you know. Change the photos. Don't use a photo that's five years old, eight years old, um, which a lot of artists do. Um, so that's... You know, that, that would be my advice in terms of the initial stages of, but try and get any coverage you can, any coverage, anything in print. And when you, when you go to clip that from the newspaper, clip the date of the newspaper, where it appeared, put it, you know, again, it doesn't have to be fancy, put it on an eight and a half by 11 sheet, neat, don't, don't, you know, don't leave the ads that appeared next to it and everything else, just, you know, uh, make it, if you have to shrink it a little bit, do, you know, don't make it microscopic, you know, use two pages if, if you're lucky enough to get an article that's written long enough about you. And go to your, your favorite, uh, you know, as I call it, the art of xerography, and, and run off copies, and don't just run off one copy, or two copies, or three copies, because you should be, do, if you're serious about this, you've got to have, you don't want to reinvent the wheel every time you send something out. Make yourself a stash. You know, and then when the stash becomes outdated, then replace the stash. So, Alexa, when you're booking a festival, or or any event for that matter, what captures your attention? What elements jump out at you when you're when you're combing through those piles on your desk? Um, well, right now, the, my programming at Aaron Davis Hall, I have the most uh, freedom to book what I like. I do a, at least five or six concerts there a year. Um, we work in, I have one room, the block, Black Box. I'm doing a series called Harlem, Harlem Black Box Live, and that's 150 seats. We, I also program the main stage, which is 700 seats, but I have the most freedom there. And so now I'm really on this kick, especially with vocalists. Espe well, I'm on this kick, especially with jazz musicians, that I'm, I just don't want to hear anyone sing A Foggy Day in London Town again. <laughs> I am so into people composing their own music and, and, and trying to work out some new something. Because, um, I, you know, I'm 40 so years original. old. Yeah, I'm 40 years old, and I just don't want to hear another 
Um, not even I cried for you. I just don't want to hear it. It's hard at this point. So I'm really looking for um, musicians to push themselves and to really develop distinct personalities. I think um, that we are, I mean, it's great that we have such a large body of jazz work that's critical and classical and great. And, but I think that at this point in my career, I want to work with people who are trying to really push the envelope and get to another level. So well, I think musically. that's, can I interject Absolutely. here? Absolutely. I think we should talk about more about that and then more about the flip side to that, mm -hmm. about knowing your niche and not trying to um, you know, fit a round peg into a square hole. Because if you are you know, playing experimental jazz, you know, you shouldn't be aggravated if uh, George Ween doesn't want to call you back, you know, or, you know, conversely, if you're doing straight ahead standards, the knitting factory might not want you. So that, that should be off your list for now, you know, but I think that if you know your audience and you know where you fit in there, then you can narrow your leads to uh, appropriate where you belong a little bit better. So what Alexis says has, has great value for everyone in every field, I think, because so, so many times people will get upset, because I've been on the other end of this too, because I do a lot of contracting of work back in Connecticut uh, for the local theater and things like that, and people will get aggravated at you if you don't call them back or you don't hire them or whatever, but if you don't fit, if you don't fit the per personal agenda for a particular concert or a particular what venue, whatever, it's nothing personal. You just don't fit it. So, you know, you need to think about what your thing is. And I know that we have done the standard repertoire for many, many years, and we have great audience, uh, you know, rapport with that. So we wouldn't try to change our thing right now because that's what brings us the most joy. And if that's what we are as artists, you know, we don't need to start doing originals now only because Alexa might book us, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I think it's important for us to, to stay true to what we do and to, and to follow that path and just stick with that. I mean, I, I play Sarah Vaughn at home daily, you know, but <laughs> Sarah Vaughn. Yeah, I think that's what I was referring to earlier when, when I spoke of signature. Everyone writes their signature differently from someone else, but everybody has a signature. So uh, it's, it's in keeping with the same thing. You just want to find your niche, find out what is that thing that you do that sets you apart from your contemporaries. And in my case, I think by the time I got in the Virginia Symphony, I showed them this white electric violin that I had just acquired, and they laughed. I said, okay. I felt a little bad about it at first. I thought about it. I pondered this, thing, this situation over the course of six months. I'm like, oh gosh, they don't think I'm very serious. But there are probably, I'll just guesstimate, a few million players that do that kind of work really well. I mean, really good, excellent. They know every sonata, every solo, every crescendo, decrescendo, finale, concerto, you name it. But I couldn't find one person in that whole orchestra that could do what I did. Mm. So that was my niche. So basically, I jumped off the diving board. I didn't know if there was water in the pool or not. But I believed that I had something here, and I ran with that, and it took me literally all over the world because I believed in me. I see we have a couple of questions. Um, uh, my question is a, a money question. <laughs> money. <laughs> I'm a vocalist um, from New Orleans and um, came up here, uh, got a really good deal on an airline ticket for my part-time job where I don't even like to admit that I still have one and every six months I have to get one you know That's all right. <laughs> sometimes you don't want to have one but you have to get it right you you but I'm able to be here as a result of that but my question is is related to money it, as a vocalist in New Orleans I've I've played at most of the respectable jazz venues and keep doing it and I'm ready to get out and um, just finished uh, my first CD which I'm very excited about and I'm trying to figure out how to, because I am still my own booking agent and manager and, and all of these things, airline tickets. I mean, I like to think of the whole world as my backyard, but you know, it takes a little more than five minutes to get to a backyard that might be about 500 miles away or even more. 
So how do you, and granted, I, w I know I probably wouldn't be able to bring a trio with me. I'd probably have to go and play with other musicians. So how do you work out, I hate talking about money with managers and club owners and that sort of thing. So how do you get creative? How, how do you get creative with budgets as far as getting to these places where I want to play, you know, whether it's in Houston or whether it's in St. Louis or anywhere? Uh, how, how do you? How do? I, is there something that I'm missing? <laughs> Have you played? And then my other the question was: my other question was with my CD, um, it's it's doing well locally and it's playing locally, and I would love to have it being played in other radio stations. But um, you know, you wonder if it's going to get pitched in the garbage when you send it. So you're concerned. So I think, well, let me just go in person and bang on somebody's door. Well, you can't go to every radio station around the country, and if you have a distribution company who's interested in it. Um, but they want you to print 3,000 copies so that they can promote it for you. Well, okay, I don't have four grand to give you 3,000 copies, so, and I don't have a sugar daddy, so <laughs> how is there, s I'm, I'm at a money level right now, and I okay, just well wanted take some good money advice. Okay, let's take the first I'm just curious, uh, have you performed outside of New Orleans? Um, I, I did my own little tour of Cape Cod last, uh, so two summers and ago, and there are that's musicians it. there you've worked with? I brought one with me because that's all I could afford okay. to do. Um, I live in New Orleans. This is my first trip away from home. I live in New Orleans part time, and um, just for Jazz Fest, a singer friend of mine, I called. I said, "You know, I might have a cute gig for you. You know, just like we'll just make it a record release party." She goes, "Well, I don't have a guitar player there." I'm like, "How could you've been here eight times? <laughs> you don't have a guitar player here? <laughs> you know, so what you have to do is jump off the diving pool, go to Houston." Find the person who can accompany you, and that becomes your person in that city. And that's so you, you know what I'm saying? So, so you go to Dallas, and, and you get that person there, and just keep your person around. And that's who you can work with when you go there, and you can add on or not. But you at least need to have, you know, develop a musical relationship with somebody in the city so that you can go there and work. I, I was just going to uh, sort of jump in. As far as expanding your world, as it were, um, I sort of think of it in, in touring terms, uh, and this goes back to the geography, uh, that y it, it depends on your, and this really is a personal thing, how energetic you are in terms of going by ground transportation. And this is again, I come back to the road atlas. Uh, the way I found initially when I got into representing artists and finding touring opportunities, I called the local NPR stations, which you can get a list of. And generally, there's somebody there who will tell you what the venues are or aren't, what, who pays the best or who, where national artists perform. And, but you've got to be willing to probably initially go by ground. Now, you could fly to Boston and do a whole New England thing by ground. Uh, what? Of my life. <laughs> no, no. The longest drive is like from Boston to Berkeley or something like that. That's not the longest drive. But anyway, the thi the th <laughs> but but it is yeah, it is long. So what what you need to do though is think of your world as a series of concentric circles, in the sense that how far can you go to get to the next gig? Now, the other thing that I that was a realization to me initially when I got into touring and sending artists out. I was thinking in terms of a very organized kind of linear situation where you go from point A to B to C in a, in a, in a kind of interesting or, or normal way. But not, you don't have to do that. You can, you, can, you can go A, B, and then go north, and then go west, and then you can, as long as you can get, I mean, it's much better if it's a, if it's a, if it's a circle. You fly to one area and you do this circle. I used to fly musicians to one spot, go by ground, do a big circle, and then they would fly back, so you would have one round trip ticket to, you know, to wherever and from wherever. But it didn't always work. It didn't. It didn't always work out that way. I mean, you have to be very creative in terms of find out what the one-way costs are for vans. Suppose you start in New Orleans and you finish up in Boston. Do you really want to drive all the way back? Now I know people that that do that. That's just the way their tour works out. But um, what you need to do is try and do some kind of loop. Uh, what you need to do is constantly broaden that circle. Um, 
you know, and as far as, as, far as budgets are concerned, uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, the hardest thing for musicians, I think, it, is to break a cycle. All the musicians I know who are, um, say, working wedding gigs, which pay great, or, or certain other kinds of gigs, which pay great, but are not necessarily artistically satisfying. You have to strike a balance and say, I'm going to invest in the press kit, I'm going to invest in the CD, I'm going to invest in getting a gig at a known club that is not going to pay me very well, which is less money than I get paid at the local dump in New Orleans or wherever it is. But that's an investment. That's all this is. And so what, in addition to setting up musician relationships, so wherever you go, you have a band, um, you need to be willing to sacrifice. And the bands I know that have made it, have broken out, short of being discovered, short of hitting it off, you know, whatever, and being lucky, the right place, right time, whatever, are the bands that have gradually broadened their awareness of themselves, and I guess sort of the way Joyce did, where you just kept broadening that circle and you're going local, local becomes, you know, a bigger reach all the time. I mean, when I started booking bands, I was booking in the Midwest, and I got this reputation as the Midwest guy. And it was basically, it's the hardest place to book in the country because of the distances and the geography and everything else. And so I had all these agencies calling me and say, oh, I can't find a gig in Rapid City, South Dakota, you know? Can you find, I have so-and-so on the road. But, but the Midwest gradually, which started out as Missouri and Iowa became, next thing I knew, I was booking in Pittsburgh and I was booking in Denver. I was booking in Minneapolis and I was booking in New Orleans. And gradually it became the entire country. And I don't think it's much different from a musician standpoint. It's just you've got to do some research. And I'm telling you, you can call NPR stations. They'll fax you a list of all their stations. You can find out, or if there are other jazz, like WWOZ, just network, 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 network. It's, it is a time investment, but you can, you can do it that way. And I, on a very grassroots level, because I've had this experience myself personally, um, my thought and theory and philosophy on how to do this at the time when I was there was, okay, there are three major music capitals in this country. Right. <laughs> there's Nashville, New York, and there's California. I mean, LA, Hollywood, you know. So I lived in two of them for an extended period of time. I actually relocated and lived there and got, I had gotten myself immersed in the scene. In California, I'm very well connected because I lived there for 12 years. When I got there, I told you my humble beginnings. I went sat in at a talent contest uh, at Marla Gibbs's club, uh, Memory Lane, Marla's Memory Lane. And one thing led to another. And then over the 12 years that I chose to stay, I met everybody from Marla to Halle Berry to every musician and, you know, and things picked up that way and then I left. When I was in New York, I stayed there. I started off at the Apollo. I got myself immersed in the scene there for a shorter period of time. Couldn't handle the winters, but, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but uh, I had gotten myself immersed in the scene there, and as a result of that, I, I came out of it knowing this whole slew of people who kind of started off from like Lenny White. Lenny White and I later came to work together about two years ago on a project with Stanley Clark and Rachel Z. And, Richie Kotzen, and you know, and then that opened up a whole nother door. So on a very grassroots level, I felt that the best way to do it and do it in a way that it would be a lot of substance to it would be to just go and live there for a while, at least a year. You know, just see who you can know, network. That's the big LA term, networking. And uh, if you can do that. Now, I, I have to speak from a woman's perspective here, because in this sense, we are unique to others of our, our comrades. I have a child, I have a four-year-old. Uh, I take her with me <laughs> everywhere I've gone for four years. This is still a work in progress for me, but I know uh, this is how I did it up till now. Now that I have the child, you know, I still have other challenges to consider that I have not come face to face with yet. I've been taking her everywhere with me. She's been to China, Puerto Rico, Canada. She, she's been everywhere. Um, now it's time for her to go to school. She's about to turn five. So that forced me to have to relocate back to the East Coast. I had no family in California. So we're in the process of doing that right now. And then we can continue this story in chapter 
40. But I, I suggest, in a nutshell, that maybe you should try, if you're in a position to do so, live in one of these three capitals. And even if you're not at the top of the food chain, on some level, you're going to be higher up than you would be, say, like in Portsmouth, Virginia. or <laughs> you know. And then if you want to go back there, you choose to go back there. Then you're a bigger fish in a small pond. I agree. Yeah. I mean, I think New York would be a great place for you because um, that's, I mean, I, I live in New York and I live in New Orleans. And I know the scene and the next step musically is New York. I mean, New Orleans is happening right now, but are New York. There, are there, thank you. I just wanted to ask one last thing, which is kind of related to everything. Are there any sponsors, uh, sponsorship type things for vocalists through maybe companies that, uh, I'm not really good at surfing the web yet, but you know, are there things out there? Are there grants? Are there things like that for vocalists who might need money for assistance in some the way? The question is, are there sponsorship programs or programs, any kinds yeah. of, of grant programs available, not just for vocalists, but for musicians? Yeah. Um, I think sometimes, so. Sometimes they're available for musicians, but they're not uh -huh. necessarily available for vocalists. That's why I wondered if there were. I think so. I, I mean, I just sat on a panel that gave away money to uh, musicians of any kind from America to support tours over in Europe. Who knew that was, I didn't know about them until they called me. <laughs> I think the web would be a really good resource for you, but there, the Thelonious Monk Institute has a vocal competition every year. Are you, are you familiar with this? Yeah. Um, I wanted to jump back into the audience and ask how, the question, how is this touring business done? Because we have been touring now for maybe five or six years out of the 20, and I have found it totally impossible for us to tour without the component of education involved. Mm -hmm. uh, because there really is no money for us in the clubs. I, I don't see where, you know, coming from out of town, yes? <laughs> coming from out of town, there would be anything available for us to make it worth our while to get on a plane or even get in a car, rent a van, which we've done many, many times, without doing college, uh, high school, college, clinics, seminars, master classes, or whatever. I mean, we, we tour up in the Massachusetts area, upstate New York, we're going to Chicago, we go to Florida, we're going out to the West Coast in October for the first time. But it is extremely difficult, and it's impossible for us to do. What the, uh, what the clubs and the concerts are for us is icing on the cake. What we want to do is play, so we need to do four, five, six master classes and clinics in order to be able to do one important club and a concert, maybe. So I, I would really, I would like to know how we can do it the other way, without with just getting in the car and going on the tour and doing the clubs and doing the concerts without the education, because it, that has eluded us. Dr. Taylor? You, ca you have to sell yourself. Uh, you can't uh, uh, go from uh, New Orleans to New York because there's no demand for you in New York. You have to establish a demand either by going there, meeting people, doing it firsthand, or by sending some uh, uh, record or some, something that will cause someone to say, oh, this is very interesting. She, she sings in a special way or something. So that means you have to send a record, a video, something. Uh, you can't send it blindly as you, uh, because you'll waste your money. Uh, so uh, what you have to do is use the, the, the net uh, you should uh, use organizations like IJ, uh, the International Association of Jazz Educators. Uh, you, you need to uh, look at who books where. There are, uh, uh, I keep throwing this figure around, there are 40,000 jazz bands and schools around the country. Now that means that there are at least 40,000 jazz programs. That means that there is an audience for you to sing at one of those schools or some of those schools if they know about you. So now, uh, so how do you get to know them? Uh, in, in a particular area, you can work through the education as, as Joyce does. Uh, the education component is what is, is making jazz, uh, is building the jazz audience, it's the thing, it's where Ken Burns left off, that's where jazz went. After, uh, 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 you get mentors there, you get teachers there, you, you have halls there. Uh, in every major school in every area of the country, uh, you can find, in many cases, five or six schools that you could play. In and around New Orleans, for instance, there are schools that uh, would get you before a club would, uh, if you can sell yourself to that school. But that's on you. You have to create a demand for what you are doing, as opposed to who? Somebody else who sings. 
or someone who else who plays. I mean, why should I book you instead of someone else that I've heard and I say, well, she does such and such. So you have to convince me, no, I'm the one that, that you want to hear. And you also have no idea of the breadth and scope of jazz education in this country. It was, I was totally unaware of it until I got involved with IAJE. I knew my local area. I knew what the jazz programs were you know, up to maybe an hour, hour and a half away from me. I had no idea of the huge amount of talent that exists out there and the extremely incredible effort that is going on all over the country in jazz education. And so as Dr. Taylor says, there is an incredible niche there and it, and it is the current niche for work. It's the only important one, I think, right now. If you identify alternate spaces where you can uh, create your own work, this is what we did with Jazzmobile in New York. Uh, we, play, we played uh, uh, not only on the streets, we played in parks, we played in, in museums, we played in libraries. You can do you know, those kinds of places. You can go in and establish uh, an afternoon for yourself. I mean, no one has to do that for you. You can go in and say, can I have a Sunday afternoon? I want to entertain the people in this, this particular area. I do such and such, and you take your group, if you can convince the people that run that library or that museum. You can also become your own promoter. I mean, we wrote for a grant last year and got $15,000 from the state of Connecticut to put on a concert that was multi-ethnic. Uh, it was one Sunday afternoon, four hours, and uh, it was a huge success. It was a huge amount of work, but we booked ourselves on it. You know, and I mean, there are ways of formulating opportunities for yourself when uh, it, see, it appears that none exist. It's a lot of work. The internet, I cannot stress, now that it exists, what, what fun it has been for me to go on there and research all kinds of ideas that are constantly popping in and out of my head about, hmm, I wonder what that Parks and Recreations does in the summertime. Oh, I wonder what that jazz does. And you can find out the names of people. In some cases, you can call them directly. I have a website. That's, uh, for me, has knocked off at least two or three hundred dollars off the annual cost of making packages. I have a website that costs 50 bucks, you know, or free, um, which has my picture, it has a link to a bio, it has a link to the Kennedy Fest, uh, Center. Um, that saved me a whole lot of mouth and a whole lot of packages. There's a picture on there. Some folks are willing to print it. A lot of people still have not caught up with that, but when you're just handing out a business card just to people in general, uh, hopefully you're in a situation where just people just kind of say, well, let me have your card, let me have your card. I have Karen Griggs, phone number, website. If they need a hard copy package, they can request it, I'll send it, I'll have it. But in nine times out of 10, I did a gig recently where they asked for those things. They did not need that. They took a picture off the website that I didn't even have from someone else's album. They printed it, they made a flyer, and promoted the gig that I did there. Yeah, um, uh, mine is a link to sound, but those are things that you can add. Of course, it gets more expensive the more you add to it, but just to start off basic, just to have your written stuff there, you can start there, and that's not gonna cost a whole lot of money like a package would, and some people are willing to print those things. Okay, oh, Penelope, you had a question. I wanted to go back to the discussion of a CD, mm -hmm. and if, if you can step back in time and remember your first CD, I was so pleased, Joyce, to hear you say that it, your first CD got national play. That's an incredibly successful story, sure. and if you can elaborate on that, and then, then to move forward and talk about perhaps your experiences and how big are your leaps when you're in a studio? Are you rehearsing prior to the sessions? And, and um, how developed is the studio environment? Is it the chambers, the different rooms, or do you prefer to be in one room? And then another thing about your engineers, do you select them? Are you producing these yourself? And what does the producer also look at? Um, do you prefer full length cuts when you're listening you know, on, a, on a CD that's brought to your attention as a demo? OK, let's take the first part again. And, and that has to do with CD uh, in general and um, how, how, it, how it enters into this whole component. Joyce, do you want to speak to that? Well, we were very lucky when we had our first CD produced. It was, um, I think we had produced 1,500 copies of it. And um, we were lucky enough to research and find a gentleman who uh, had been retired from Concord Records and had a million connections. And he believed in our music, and he sent it out out of the goodness of his heart. And he sent it all over the country, and we figured we'd better run with that. And we'd better do all the legwork involved in calling all of those radio station DJs 
and uh, becoming friendly with them. And, and they are some of the unsung heroes of this business because even though there are so few jazz stations left, the ones that are out there are the only ones we can hang on to. And uh, those people need to know who we are. And if we play music that fits into their particular format, they will play you. They, you know, they might not play you as often as you would like, but they will play you. And we've gotten phone calls from all over the country from people who actually, this am still amazes me after all these years. Pa people take the time to call a radio station to ask for a particular record and find how they can reach you so they can buy the record. And even when you have distributorship, I'll be darned if I can find my own CD no matter where I go. <laughs> it's unbelievable to me. I mean, the, the distributor says, you know, you call them up and you say, we're going to upstate New York on tour. You go to the Tower Records or whatever records, can't find it. So you really need to do your own promotion, your own legwork, your own selling of CDs off the bandstand or whatever. And that's how our, our whole CD thing came about. Um, in terms of recording engineering, and, and I am not comfortable in the studio. I don't know if I ever will be because what we do is so intimate, three people, we sit as closely as we possibly can on the stage. You go into a studio, it's totally alien now. <laughs> so, you know, that, I, I don't know if I, can, if I can speak well to that. We found a studio that we loved simply because it had a marvelous piano and a wonderful engineer, and he went and moved out of town on me. So for the last two CDs, we've had nothing but um, hardship trying to find a good studio, bring in an engineer that's, you know, sympathetic to the trio sound, the acoustic nature of it. So it's been, a, it's been a real trial in that aspect. I mean, I went into my first recording session thinking how well prepared we were, how wonderful this was going to be because we've been together for so long, you know, have yet to have a bad night on the bandstand. Go in there and it wasn't until I got home that I realized it was so alien an environment with the three of us in separate rooms. And I play 99% of the time with my eyes shut and it wasn't until I got home I realized I had done the whole session with my eyes open and I felt like a completely different musician. And it was not an easy experience. So that's, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer your question, Penelope? Same way I feel, Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> I think in my case, with the demo side of things, I had always had friends who had had pieces of equipment, and I thought, oh, that is so ugly. I would never put that in my house. Uh, you know, the mixing board, the knobs, and the little lights, dials, and VU meters. I just thought, oh, that's so ugly. Eventually, I did invest in a piece of equipment that would allow me to get my ideas onto some kind of format. In this case, it's digital. Um, so what I have learned to operate, I've become a trained techie on the 1680. Very complicated machine. <laughs> Took me about six, seven months to get it. But I am able to make my own demos. It, it allows you, what, I don't know how many tracks. You get 16, they have a 2480 now. Then you get all these virtual tracks underneath. So I actually took the time, sat there with the module, the trial and error. I called a rep over from Roland and, you know, to kind of reduce the learning curve a bit. And I learned how to work that machine. So now I don't have to depend on an engineer. I have to depend on me. The Roland rep, he was great. And I have to say, there's always a support system you have to have for whatever you're going after. There, I keep speaking of me and my gigs. and. But when I think about it, there have been tons of people throughout all the years who have been there one way or the other, whether it was my family or someone like a Roland rep who helped reduce the learning curve of making a demo on this complicated machine. But, um, you know, you have to go beyond the facet of just what you do. I think um, you'll find that to have that skill, that it's like they say, knowledge is power. So it puts me in a position where I don't necessarily have to pay someone for a demo. Now, I'm not a producer. I'm not a producer, I, I'm clear about that. I learned that through this experience. So I don't have to argue with anyone who's a producer when they say I wanna produce you and they want you kind of like, you know, don't be overly talkative about what you think should happen, don't be so opinion. I'm cool with that because I know where in my talents boundaries are. So, but in order for me to get my ideas down, I can do that, I can give them something that they can play with, work with, dump into their machine. Uh, perhaps switch over to a two-inch tape if we prefer that sound. But the idea is, I think, just to try to be more involved in the components of what it takes to make your career happen. Learn a little bit about the technical aspects of it as well. Uh, yes, uh, my question has to do with the aspect of making a CD um, as a vocalist. Uh, and my question is this, I'm very much on the local level. Um, I have a list of musicians I can call if I have a gig coming up 
And they'll say, how much does it pay? We'll rehearse one or two times and we'll do the gig. How do I find uh, a group of compatible musicians to do the studio work with um, other than, I mean, if I had to, I guess I could try to scrounge money to pay them, but that's really tough. Uh, I'd love to have a regular band that I could say was my band, but most of the really good musicians, and I live in this area, seem to be really, really busy. <laughs> um, so I, I was just wondering if anyone had any insights on that. Can I just interject one thing? I want to encourage all the musicians and promoters and producers to say, uh, like, you're not local, you're Washington, D.C. based. Joyce is Connecticut based. I'm based out of New York and the Wallens. It's not like low, you know? Yeah. Okay, let me just restate the question, and it has to do with um, recording a CD, and how do you find musicians to play on your CD with you if you don't necessarily have a regular working band, and how do you fund that? I'm willing to rehearse with you more than once to uh -huh. get the CD right. <laughs> okay, Joyce and Karen. That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I find that the people that we wind up helping, let's say, are friends. You know, so you need to formulate a network of musicians that you're compatible with, maybe that you've grown up with, or that are, you know, are are in your area that might want to spend time with you because they're your friend. That's the only thing I can suggest is because everyone is so busy, and I know how busy I am, and I, I get phone calls all the time, you know, to help with something or other, and and. When I had the time, I always did it. But now that I don't have the time, I'll do it if it's for a friend. But you know, I, there are two separate ways to look at it. One way to look at it is you want to find people um, that you can relate to, that you're happy with on the bandstand, that give you a good vibe, and that put some joy out there. The, on the other side, there are maybe the best musicians in town that you want to hire out to back you up on your CD. So you need to determine which one you want. One might be a more long-standing relationship. The other one might get you a little further on that first initial listen if someone's listening to the first eight bars of your CD. That you could speak to better than I could because I, I, I don't know the answer. I always tend to, when we talk to the, to the um, school, kids in the schools, you know, we always say it's more important that on the bandstand there's compatibility and that there's a lot of love flowing around because the music eventually will, will show that rather than maybe an ego or two on the bandstand and, and then it's, it, everybody's grating on each other's nerves. You know, that's not, that's not the way to make music. So, you know, depending on the way the promoters listen to the music, that would be a good answer to find out. So again, it comes back to relationships uh -huh. and networking like Karen was saying in the first place. That's exactly what I was going to say. It just comes down to establishing that rapport. The musicians that I've had the long-term relationships with as colleagues, uh, I mean, we know a little more about each other than about the music. I mean, we talk about each other's families and what other gigs are we doing, and this has gone on over the years, and so it just comes down to that. And then sometimes friends can be the worst people to, to work with because they take you for granted that, like sometimes our families do. And so you tell them to show up to the gig, and just because they've known you since you were two, they'll show up 10, 15 minutes later. And, you know, sometimes it's better to work with, you know, it could, it's a give and take. Uh, you know, you have to kind of weigh the yin and the yang about the situation and, and just find all the characteristics. You want someone who can play, someone who's going to be there, someone who's, okay, we have to care about money, but it doesn't have to be like, you know, the first thing shooting out of their mouth every single time. Um, I have a problem with that, I do, because I mean, I, I'm, I do this because I love it, and it sent me through many ups and horrendous crashes, and then back up and then level off for a while, I mean, it looks like a sine wave, you know, a signature or something, and uh, I do, I put myself through this because I really, really sincerely dig what I'm doing, I love this, this is why I live for this, and, and that's, you know, just to get that rush that happens when the audience digs what you do, so you want to deal with people who like working with you who feel good about work, that when they're with you, you know, you guys you, you gel on stage, and it's not fake, you know when it's real and when it's not. When it's not, you just kinda, you know, not that, that thing, the Hollywood thing, it's like, you know, no, when it's real, you just, it's something you feel, I can't describe it in a word, but you just know it. Those are the people you wanna work with. They may not be the best players, but sometimes the vibe overshadows the ability because they can see your energy on stage is slamming. I mean, you know, that, Sometimes what people want to feel, and what are you playing for but to make your listeners and your observers feel better for that moment? Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, this young lady here. Uh, 
Um, it's actually an answer to the last question. Um, I did make a CD, and it, it, took an it took my last penny, really, to do it. But one of the things I found with the musicians I used is I did use my regular musicians, and I did offer them a fee, and it wasn't very big. But they, they were happy with it. One of them waived it. And one of the things I realized is that, in a sense, you're doing them a favor as well. And that is, every time you put a CD out, their name is on it too. So in a sense, that there is a two-way thing there, I think. You don't have to offer a huge amount of money because you're giving them free publicity. And I found that that worked very well. And they, they did a really nice job for me. And I was very grateful for that. If you need every bit of help you can. So it's a two-way street. OK, thank you. Um, yes, way in the back there. Okay. And I'm uh, representing, on a part-time basis, a friend who's a, a wonderful fl uh, jazz fl flautist. Um, he's trying to break into the market in Washington, D.C. area. He plays between Philadelphia and Richmond. And the thing I wonder about, I believe that he should be pushing his, what he, what he asked to be paid higher. But what I, I wonder is, what, what's the norm? How do you know what to ask for and, and what the market will bear without out pricing yourself out of the market? Well, boy, if I, if I knew the answer to that question, that's, that's the million dollar question. Billy has, has a solution. <laughs> Every agent in the country knows to the penny what we all make. And I think that uh, if we are more honest with each other as to what we make, uh, it'll help us in the long run. I mean, so that you know that someone works and makes X amount of dollars, someone else who uh, may have a record or may have uh, some support of another kind makes Y dollars, which is much more. Uh, and uh, you can know, if you know that, you know where you would fit in and why. You know that, that uh, uh, you have to look at uh, uh, the place where you're playing. If it's a, uh, um, a 20, 20 uh, uh, say an 1800 uh, seat house and you can only put 200 people in there then you're not going to be as effective as someone who can fill the house mm -hmm. so you can't ask for that kind of money you have to play uh, to fill those those houses that are 100 200 500 seats because maybe you can do that you know so you have to think along those lines where you are what it costs you to work and and what you can comfortably share with the, with, with the people that, that you work with, considering the fact that you have to do your own promotion, you have to do many things which are costly to you to make uh, the next job possible. Yeah, this person has five CDs and has packed the house in Philadelphia, and, but is also loyal to some people in, you know, in gigs that have employed him when he first started working. So he keeps going back. And of course, they can't pay any more than they did before. And, uh, well, in a, in, a, in a club situation, you're, you're limited by the by the uh, uh, how many seats are in the club, or what. What in 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 a larger facility, uh, this this is why many musicians don't play clubs anymore. They play larger facilities because uh, you can get more people in this room than you can get into the average average club. And so, if you're charging ten dollars a piece, you've got more than you would have if you were working in uh, in say uh, Blues Alley and and going for the door. Thank you. I think another thing that you could do is talk to people, share information. We really need to do so much more of that. Um, I think we were probably all raised the same way. I mean, you don't tell your salary. It's a big secret. Um, I think that, that we've reached a point in our society where, you know, in order to support ourselves in this music, we have to share our resources and our information. So if you know someone who's played there or you know someone who knows someone, call them up and ask them, you know, not um, what exactly is it, but can you just give me an idea of what the range is and then see where you fit in within that range. Be sneaky. Call them as though you're going to offer them a job. <laughs> uh, be sneaky. Um, can I, I just speak to that? Uh, as somebody who presents in a small market in the 100 seat club venue and the 1000 seat up to the 1000 seat uh, i think what what dr taylor says it's it it does come down to a great extent what you can do for that house for that presenter the other the other aspect of it is you need to know the the booking situation 
whether it's a subsidized situation, whether it's a quote unquote hard ticket, which most clubs are, they're for-profit businesses that are trying to survive just like you're trying to survive. And then there is, and Linda and I were talking about this, when somebody, let's say, has been booking themselves for X number of years and they've developed those relationships with those club owners or presenters and they've gone in for such and such a fee and then all of a sudden they have artist representation and management and uh, 14 mouths to feed to then all of a sudden the fee is like quadrupled overnight as a presenter that's a difficult thing for me to to absorb you know um, of course as an artist representative it's easy <laughs> <laughs> and it's fair <laughs> um, so it, there is there is a give a take and it is a very personalized business as it is a very personalized music and, and I have found in the 15, 16, 17 years I've been involved in jazz promotion from one side or the other, or both sides, that um, there are these relationships and there is no set formula. There is no exact whatever. It's, it's really what the market will bear. Uh, it has to do with how good you are at negotiating on a given day. I, I have learned personally when there are times that I think I'm gonna do a terrible job negotiating either absorbing a contract contractual fee or going and try and getting, get one for a musician that I literally have stopped myself from getting on the phone because I can just tell that I am not, you know, I got those triple negative biorhythms working. It's time for a nap, not to be on the phone negotiating, you know, a contract or something. Uh, I do think you have to take into consideration what those relationships are. I do think you have to take into consideration that the potential gross for a 100-seat club at $20 a head is $2,000. And, and uh, you know, if, if you're coming in there with a $3,500, you know, fee, you know, the, the club owner, as much as he loves you, loves the music, wants to work with you, et cetera, unless that's somehow subsidi subsidized, it's not going to happen. The university concert series are largely subsidized and it kind of quite frankly screws with the marketplace when you have somebody in your market who can hire a performer that you would hire and, and they're not concerned with the gate per se because the university is going to pay X, X amount of dollars, et cetera. So there are all these converging things in the marketplace that um, you know, and, and I think sharing information is, is good, but I think it's also, it is a difficult thing because there is a certain sense of privacy and there is a certain sense of uh, individual relationships that people have built up and not, not one situation is the same as the next on the one hand. On the other hand, there are uh, barometers, there are dividing lines, there are um, limitations, you know, such and such a club, I think they, you know, generally known that they can go to this figure or this university is a great stop on the tour. <laughs> you want to get your gig there, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, I, I think it's it's a it's a really is a give and take. It's a, it's it's a it's an interesting process. That's that's for sure. So, thank you. Who else had a question in here? I'm not really so plugged into what's happening on the internet. What are the possibilities of promoting your your CD, your own CD on the internet. I hear that there are companies that will basically put you out there. I, uh, does something like that actually okay. exist? The question has to do with what kind of promotion uh, is available for your CD on the internet, and the answer is lots. Endless. <laughs> that having been said, go ahead. Well, there's mp3.com. I mean, there's all kinds of um, free music websites that allow you to upload your music, maybe two or three songs, maybe the whole CD. You just have to get get on the net and stay on the net. But uh, you could put your stuff, if you had your music, well, there's just a lot you can do. I can't begin to go into it. But mp3.com is a great place to go and learn about it. Something we've started doing now is the email press release. Uh, and we haven't discussed this about um, mailing lists either. I mean, in the old days, we took names and addresses and we had mailing lists. And, and although we still do that, especially if we travel and we have names in that particular area, we make sure to mark it to that list. 
But now, I mean, everyone gives you their email address. So if you can compile a list of email addresses and then I haven't figured out how to do it yet, I still do them one at a time, <laughs> there's a way to click the button and send to everyone at once. I know, I'll take any suggestions. But if you're doing something of note, um, you might want to send email press releases. You can get um, email addresses in Jazz Times, IAJE, um, ads, newsletters, everywhere. Downbeat, all kinds of... Uh, publications that have email addresses of particular people that you want to target. And you might want to send your email if you're doing a particular thing. I, last year in uh, the fall, I tried it for the first time when I was on Marion McPartland's show. And I figured if I don't take this opportunity to let people know I'm on the show, not that many people will hear it because it's very difficult to market something like that. It's on different times in all different segments of the country. And so I could not say to everyone, listen on Thursday at 3 o'clock because Marion's show will be on. But I tried to send out a press release that raised awareness just for the fact that I was on it and hoped that people would tune in and listen to it. I don't know. You, n you never know if anyone even opens them, but you try and make the, uh, the headline of it, the title of it, something attractive enough that someone will want to open it. There are two vocalists right now, both out of New York, who have me on their email list. And I've never hired either one of them. I know one day they're going to get a gig. I follow their, their escapades around the country and around the world. And when I see them, I'm like, I saw you at top of that mountain singing in front of They send <laughs> pictures and stuff. And so it gives me stuff to talk to them about, even though I have it sort of breaks the ice so that, you know. But those email things work. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't read every piece of my email, but I do read from those two because I want to see what gigs they're getting. And, bo and I, in disbelief, I'm like, they're getting all these gigs. Mm -hmm. and I'm get afraid a gig we're going to have to wrap things up because it's, uh, it's time.